grade 9 scientists. we got a small topic to cover today. Okay, it's an enormous topic. We're going to try to cover the universe. And while I can't do that in any particular succinct way, I'm going to do my very best today to give you the outline of some of the key ideas uh, to get you to understand your place in the universe and how we study it in the field of astronomy. And you can bet your life that long before the invention of science as a field, your ancestors, humanity, has forever been fascinated by the skies. And I don't know about you, but I like to consider myself a bit of a stargazer. And it's pretty incredible to look up at the night sky. And it's quite humbling as well. It makes you feel small and curious. How can you not be dazzled by beautiful displays like the stars, uh, the moon, the sun, and of course what you see in this picture here, the aurora borealis in the far north, which I've been fortunate enough to see with my own eyes. Uh, truly moving and breathtaking phenomena that have shaped so many cultures all over the world. Here you can see in the UK an ancient structure, Stonehenge, where on the solstice a shadow is cast directly in the middle of this circle of stones. Clearly these people were calculating and measuring the movement of things in the sky. Uh, here in Africa, the building of the Great Pyramids, which face perfectly to the north, south, east, and west on the four faces of these structures. Uh, surely these were oriented in a way that was sensitive to their place on the planet. In South and Central America, the entire communities, entire religious structures centered around the astronomical, astrological patterns uh, that they were able to see uh, on one of the most important holidays of the uh, Mayan culture. The sun would rise straight up over this mountain down the center of this community. Um, complex calendars based on the stars. Of course, in China, you have these star maps, and, and then in the Middle East, um, an incredible history in the ancient Muslim world of the uh, invention of so much uh, of our mathematics and our tools to study the world, uh, in a lot of ways, kind of the birthplace of modern day science. But it's the Europeans that really uh, have come to dominate our thinking on space and astronomy, uh, particularly through the work of people like Copernicus, who created this page uh, of descriptions of tools and measurements for studying space. This is more of the formalized mathematical numerical study uh, of astronomy that has led to most of our modern day discoveries. And very sadly along the way, I think we've lost a lot of the ancient knowledge that we used to have. But boy, have we gained some incredible new insights uh, throughout time using the scientific method. And so ultimately, it's led to the creation of some unbelievable tools that our ancestors, no matter what culture they were a part of, could have never imagined we'd have access to. The Hubble telescope floating in orbit around our planet with nothing obstructing its view whatsoever has been able to look out into the universe and see clarity that we've never had the ability to see throughout all of human history. We've gone to space. This, the space program has sent humanity out there in rocket ships. We've landed on the surface of the moon. We have people that live and study in space at the International Space Station. We've come to understand uh, some aspects of space in ways uh, that have boggled the mind. The Hubble telescope has let us see views of Mars like this. Okay. A truly crystal clear image of that planet. And now we can do even better. We have landed several robots onto the surface of this planet. These rovers have been exploring the surface of another planet as a proxy for us landing with our own feet there. But we're on this planet. You know, here is an actual photograph, a high resolution photograph taken by the Curiosity rover of the surface of Mars. And here it is taking a selfie uh, on the surface of that planet. A truly unbelievable photographs, imagery, uh, data and information that we're able to gather now about our universe. 
The Hubble telescope has showed us pictures like this of what we would call a globular cluster. And to your eyes, when you look up at the sky at night, that might look like a single white dot. You would think that it's one star. But when we zoom in with our most powerful telescopes, we see that some of these globular clusters are between 100,000 and a million stars in that one spot. Imagine how many stars there are out there. And remember, the closest star to you is, of course, the sun. We didn't stop there. The Hubble telescope has showed us all kinds of unbelievably spectacularly beautiful things that are out there. These are clouds of superheated gases that are emitting light that we can see. We call them nebulas. Uh, I'm not exactly sure even what this one is. Uh, behaving in all sorts of interesting and strange ways. Uh, here's an incredible sequence of photographs that actually shows us how things change over time and space. And over the span of several weeks, you can actually watch a star die. This is an explosion of a star uh, turning into a planetary nebula. We can see whole galaxies out there, not just one point of stars like a globular cluster of millions, but this can be billions, up to a hundred billion stars in one single galaxy. Here you can see three of them in a single photograph. And if you're not feeling small yet, well look at this photograph. You see, the deeper we look into space, the farther back we look in time. And what do I mean by that? Well, the light that would be emanating from this object right here okay, can travel only at a certain rate. It's not instant. So that light must travel from its origin star all the way through the universe over time until it reaches the lens of the Hubble telescope. And so the farther away the object, the longer it's taken the light to go from that object through space to reach the lens, which means that by the time that light has finally reached the lens of the Hubble telescope, I mean, that object might not even exist anymore. Here we are looking literally billions of years into the past. And what you can see is that the universe used to be very, very different. This is one of the deepest photographs that the Hubble telescope has ever taken into space. We call this a deep field photograph. And these are not individual stars you're looking at, but each one of these is a separate galaxy. It has become apparent that these galaxies used to be much, much closer together and have since been spreading out. And the distances between objects has been getting farther and farther over time. We are getting so good at not only looking at space, but going there that we now have private companies like SpaceX that are designing reusable rockets that are reducing the cost of space travel uh, to such levels that it may be possible for us to actually get a human being onto another planet within your lifetime. That could be you. So where are we? What is this? How do we fit? Finding our place. I mean, the first thing that we need to note is that you are on one piece of rock that is orbiting around a star. And there it is, the sun. And as it does go around that sun, it is spinning around its own axis. And so here you can see that this side of our planet is facing the sun, and this side is facing away from the sun. And since our little rock is round, only about half of that rock is lit up at any moment day and night. And we've, we've been able to do some really interesting calculations that have really shaped your everyday life. We know that it takes 24 hours, actually 23 hours and 58 minutes, for the world to do one complete rotation around its axis. Okay? We call that a day. We also know that in 365 and a quarter days, the Earth makes one complete revolution around the sun. 
we call that a year. So to try to figure out what the sun is and where it came from and what this planet is and where it came from, we can start to find clues by looking out into space at other objects and seeing if they can reveal some of the patterns of how other stars might have formed and how other planets might have formed. So that's what you're seeing here. This nebula is a cloud of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. And if you remember from the beginning of grade 9 science, we learned that all matter is attracted to all other matter. That's one of the fundamental principles of particle theory. And so if you have no resistance, nothing between an atom of hydrogen here and an atom of hydrogen here, very, very slowly over time, those atoms will start to approach each other. And so this nebula is slowly, slowly, slowly caving in on itself. And what's really fascinating is that we can find many of these nebulae out there. Uh, and here they are. Uh, with something really strange happening. If you look at the very center of these clouds of gas, there seems to be an extra bright object. What you're seeing happening in the center of this nebula, and this is a real photograph of an actual object that we can observe in space, that super bright spot is where the temperature and pressure have gotten so intense from all of this gravity of such a massive cloud of gas coming together that we've started the process of nuclear fusion. And that's what's happening in the core of our own closest star, the Sun. So inside of a star, which is made mostly of hydrogen and helium, uh, the hydrogen comes in two main isotopes. Here we have deuterium with a mass of two. It's a proton and a neutron. And we have tritium with a mass of three, proton and two neutrons. And when those enter the core of the star, the pressure and the gravity is so intense that these atoms will actually fuse into a single atom. And now we don't just have one proton in the nucleus, we have two. This has gone from hydrogen to helium. And when it does that, it spits out an extra neutron, which is free to make more of these isotopes from the surrounding hydrogen atoms. But we've created a new element. Okay. When that happens, this process of nuclear fusion releases an incredible amount of energy, which is why those surrounding gases get incredibly super hot. You see, the sun is not burning. It's actually just superheated hydrogen and helium gas that's so hot it has turned into plasma, which is one phase above gas. And one of the properties of plasma is that it emits visible light. And so here are those isotopes of hydrogen. Here's that process of nuclear fusion. And when you fuse deuterium with tritium, you form helium and release one of those neutrons, which is free to create more of these isotopes. And this becomes a self-perpetuating nuclear chain reaction. So when you, were, when you look at the sun, don't think of this as fire, think of this as superheated plasma. So here's an incredible concept. If you can take hydrogen and make helium, maybe this is where all of the elements in the universe come from as well. And evidence shows that that seems to be true. The simplest element in the universe is hydrogen with just one single proton in the nucleus. When we fuse them together, we can form helium. But why stop there? If the mass of a star is big enough, you can fuse helium with other elements as well. And we can start to form bigger and bigger elements as we go. And so here you can see the formation of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen in this layer, and another layer deeper silicon and then magnesium and neon and iron. And these things will separate out in layers by density because of course the heavier elements will sink and the lighter elements will float. And so the larger the star, the more elements are being fused in its core. 
we believe that this is where all of the elements on the periodic table come from. This is where every element comes from that makes up your body. They were forged in the core of stars. And we can still see this going on even today. And so when we look out at those stars, we recognize that the sun, as large as it is relative to us, is actually not that big a star compared to many of the other ones we can observe. We have some truly enormous stars that are so large and so hot that they appear more blue. And the cooler and smaller stars appear more on the red side of the spectrum. And so this is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And what it's trying to do is to try to group the stars according to their characteristics. So along the x-axis, we have the temperature of the stars. Here you have the cooler ones. Here you have the hotter ones. And then here we're trying to get an estimate of how large these stars are by looking at their total light output. A little bit of light output down here, a lot of light output over here. We call that factor luminosity. And so generally, the more light it's giving off in total, the larger that star must be. And it's no surprise uh, that we see this nice linear pattern running down the middle. There is a direct relationship between the temperature of that star and the size of that star. The bigger it is, the hotter it gets. And that's because it has more material, which means it's going to have a stronger pull of gravity. And you're going to have more nuclear fusion going on in its core. Here's a diagram that shows the same thing but with real data points and when you look at those real data points you can see that the vast vast majority of the stars that we look at in fact it's about 90 percent of the stars we've ever discovered fall in that nice linear pattern that we call the main sequence but there are these mysterious other regions around the main sequence that don't fit the same pattern what are those well this has given us some clues into the full life cycle of a star these low mass stars that are a bit cooler have less gravity and therefore burn their fuel a little bit slower. So they live their lives for much longer. And towards the end of their life, rather than having a big dramatic ending, their outer margins simply dissipate away as they run out of fuel. And all that's left behind is a tiny glowing core. And we'd call this much smaller but much hotter uh, star giving off more light output, okay, just the core of those stars left behind, those are called white dwarfs. So that represents the end of the life of a low mass star. An intermediate mass star starts to peel off of the main sequence um, because towards the end of its life, which is a little bit shorter as it's burned hotter with more uh, nuclear fusion in the core, uh, the core starts to collapse when it runs out of fuel, and the outer margins start to expand. And this creates what we call red giants. And of course, our sun is somewhere along this medium-sized star range, and it's predicted that that one day is what might happen to our star. And then these enormous stars up here with the highest uh, outputs, our, our, our blue giants, are going to turn into super giants. And what that means is that their cores, as they collapse, um, then cause a massive expansion of the outer margins that can still stay very, very hot. Now, they're also then going to start to cool, and you can get these enormous red giants out here as well. Um, when they're finished their life, they erupt in an explosion that we call a supernova. And so here you can see that life cycle mapped out a little more visually. Low mass star, long life, this is our time axis. They'll eventually start to fizzle out and turn into either a brown dwarf and then disappear, or a red dwarf uh, followed by, as the margins dissipate, a white dwarf left behind, just the core. An intermediate mass star like our sun is going to turn into a red giant as the outer margins expand, and it may explode into a small planetary nebula uh, and then leave behind a white dwarf, um, or perhaps it might have a larger explosion and create something more along the lines of a supernova, but a small one. And then these larger stars that burn blue are going to have a really dramatic finish. Enormous red and blue giants, and then massive supernovas. And what they may leave behind in their wake are these mysterious objects that we know as black holes, uh, which seem to be an incredibly dense spot with so much gravity that not even light can escape its pull.
So here's the basic sequence. A nebula will condense on itself until eventually there is nuclear fusion in its core and the star is born. But something else is happening here. After that star is born, this leftover material seems to flatten out into a pancake and then turn into planets. So let's have a look at where the Earth itself comes from. So when the Sun was first formed, uh, it was spinning. And anything that spins, very much like uh, taking a round ball of dough, if you try to give a spin to it, its tendency is going to start to flatten out. And so some of the material, as this thing flattens out, stops collapsing into the core and ends up in a stable orbit. And at first, during the formation of a star, that would just be clouds of dust. But of course, those clouds of dust in their stable orbits are attracted to each other. And so they start to clump together into larger and larger pieces. And then those larger and larger pieces start to collide until eventually they form planets. So let's have a look at why they've got this spin to them. Here you can imagine two objects colliding in space. And as soon as they do, they've still got that gravity that's attracting them to each other. So while they may bounce off of each other temporarily, now they begin to orbit each other. And they develop what's called angular momentum. And you can imagine collision after collision after collision would be changing the overall direction of that spin, but still spinning and churning until eventually you get these larger and larger objects with their own individual spins. So the sun is spinning one way and the earth is spinning another. Okay. So here you can see what might be what the early formation of the Earth would have looked like, very much like the formation of a star. Now all of this light being given off is not from nuclear fusion, it's simply from the friction of all of these millions upon millions of collisions between rocks. And since they're doing this in the emptiness of space, there's no air for that heat to dissipate out really into. The rocks hold on to a lot of that heat and stay glowing molten and hot. They even liquefy. And so as this keeps going uh, over millions of years, okay, eventually what you're left with are just some pretty large chunks. Uh, and forming in the middle of those chunks is the biggest chunk of all. This is starting to form into a planet. And maybe by the end of this sequence, you would have enormous chunks slamming into each other. And we believe that it's a collision like the one you're seeing on the screen right now that ultimately resulted in a piece breaking off of this ball going into a steady orbit. And we now call it the moon. Okay, and the larger the object, the more gravity it has towards that central point, and the more it tends to form a perfect round ball. And so at the end of this process, when there's next to no debris left, this is what the Earth would have looked like. A glowing, hot, molten piece of rock. And as it cooled, some of the elements and compounds on it begin to change form. For example, liquid water uh, at the temperatures that this thing cooled down to uh, could start to condense into rain and form the oceans. And then, of course, some turns into hard rock. And so we ended up with a planet like this. So that's the basic sequence, nebula to star, and then the leftover material from that star turned into the individual planets. And if this is true, and it seems to be, that would mean that pretty much every star that you look at out in space must also have planets. And we're starting to discover that that seems to be playing out in reality too. We're able to find them as we see those planets, what we call transit in front of the stars. We can see a little gap when they go in front of their stars relative to the telescopes that's looking at those stars. And so around our star, we have eight distinct planets from the leftover materials of the formation of the sun. And here they are, broken down in a way that might be a little bit easier to remember. We have the four inner planets, and then there's a row of asteroids, which are these smaller bits that have not formed a planet. And then we have the outer planets. Okay, The inner planets are mostly made out of rock, and the outer planets are mostly made out of 
gas. And again, this is unsurprising that the more dense materials kind of sink to the uh, uh, towards the sun, okay, closer they sink, and the less dense the materials uh, floated out to the outer margins of our solar system. Uh, and so rocky and gaseous. And you can also see that the size of these outer planets is much, much larger than the size of these inner planets. We call these the gas giants. And many of these have even more leftover material around them. In fact, Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune all have many, many moons. And Saturn even has a leftover ring uh, based on the way that it's spinning. Okay, here's a little bit more to scale uh, the size of these different objects. And why are some things considered planets and other things not? Well, really, it's these arbitrary distinctions that people have put onto them. So basically what we say is that if that planet is uh, large enough to form a nearly perfect sphere, uh, that's one of the main criteria for being uh, called an official planet. Uh, this right here is a photograph of Pluto that used to be considered a planet, but we then discovered that in fact it's not perfectly round. It's a little bit more oval and it has a moon that's almost the same size as it. They're kind of orbiting around each other. Furthermore, it doesn't orbit on that same uh, pancake uh, level as the rest of the planets. It's kind of on its own orbit. And so this was downgraded then to a dwarf planet, but still an enormous object. Uh, when we get even smaller, you can start to see things like asteroids, which are so small that they're actually irregularly shaped. Uh, and finally, you have objects that are made mostly out of ice and dust, and those are called comets. And what's really cool about those is that when the solar wind, so particles coming off of the sun, hit these little bundles of ice, it knocks off little tiny ice crystals that reflect light, and it appears to us like a tail. They're quite spectacular to see. Comets. And so how do we measure things in space? Well, these distances are unreal. And to try to put our heads around them, we've had to create new units of measure to try to wrap our heads around distances. So things within our solar system, we tend to measure relative to how far are we from the sun. We call that a single astronomical unit, and that's about 93 million miles. And so now you can measure things using that as a benchmark, which would mean that Jupiter is actually about 5.2 astronomical units away from the sun, which means that it is 5.2 times farther than the Earth is from the sun. But objects that are outside of our solar system would just be too many astronomical units. The universe is beyond your wildest dreams, enormous. And so we've had to create yet another unit of measurement to try to capture those distances. And that is a unit called light years. And when you see years, you probably think about time, but this is actually a measure of distance. The idea behind this is that light is traveling at a fixed speed, which means that over the course of a year, it would go a fixed distance. And so a light year is the distance that light travels over the course of one year. The closest star to Earth other than the Sun, so the next closest star, is called Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.2 light years away, which means that if you were looking at Proxima Centauri with your eyes, you would actually be seeing it 4.2 years ago. And that, again, is the closest star to you. Okay, most of the objects in the universe are way farther than that, many, many, many more light years away. Remember that deep field image that's looking billions of years away. Okay, so if you look up at the night sky with the naked eye, you won't really see this very clearly. But if you point a camera up at the sky and you leave it on a long exposure, so let's say you leave it on a 30 second exposure and you place it on a tripod, you might get a photograph like this one here. This is a real picture of what the night sky looks like if we let it gather enough uh, light that is uh, not bright enough for our eyes to really detect. And clearly it looks like there's some kind of object up there. Uh, 
Uh, it is vaguely visible to the naked eye, but it really comes to life when we see it with a camera. And so we've come to realize what it is. It's this, a galaxy. You are in it, right here. This is called the Milky Way, and you are essentially in a bundle of many billions of stars orbiting around this central point. Let me show it to you again. If we go back, you can see it's like looking into that central point. Can you see it? We are inside of this galaxy. So there it is, grade nines. You are in a galaxy of billions of stars. And that galaxy is only one of countless galaxies that are out there. It is humbling, it is awe-inspiring, and I hope you agree with me, it is so well worth studying. There's so much more that we could talk about, but that's all the time that we have for today's lesson. Please let this be the very beginning of your journey into thinking about and understanding as much as you can about space and the universe. Hope that was helpful. Thanks.